All right, so now we're looking at set two of the AP Physics C electricity and magnetism free response questions. Um, if there's any corrections, I'll put it in the description below or um, a pinned comment. A very long non-conducting cylinder surrounded by thin con concentric con conducting cylindrical shell as shown in the cutout view. Okay, so set one, they did a sphere. You guys have a cylinder. Segment of length L on the inner sphere has a net charge of plus Q and the outer shell is plus four Q. The radii of the inner cylinder and outer shell are plus three R and three R respectively. Um, okay, it's shown in the cross-sectional view. Determine the charge on the outer surface of the cylindrical shell with length L. Well, so this guy has a charge of Q and this has four Q. Wait, is it plus Q, plus Q and plus four Q? So this has to have plus a negative Q here. So the outer shell has to have plus five Q to balance that. And this negative Q compensates for this positive Q here. And then you have a plus five Q on the outside. So plus five Q. Using Gauss's law, derive an expression for the electric field distance from the center of the inner cylinder for R less than big R. Express your answers here. So in if you're inside here, right? Then um, what is Gauss's laws? I'm going to integrate the electric flux. The flux of the electric field is the Q enclosed over epsilon naught. And when you integrate that over the area, it's kind of like you assume it's like lateral, right? So the surface area of a cylinder is 2 pi r squared um, L. Uh, no, sorry. I don't know what I'm doing. It's 2 pi r L. So I have a cylinder, if I have a cylinder with length L and I just want to know the, the area of the around the side is the um, circumference times the um, times the length here, right? So two pi R L um, times the electric field, sorry. So this is the area, this is the electric field. The charge enclosed is going to be a ratio. Sorry, this is a little r. I'm not doing a good job explaining. So it's a little r, so it's like a little shell around here, right? It's a little r, so we're doing that cylinder. And that equals the charge enclosed. Now, the charge enclosed is a ratio of the, the, the total plus q charge is the ratio of the volumes, right? And the volume is pi r squared l over pi big r squared l, All right? It's the ratio of the volumes of the inner cylinder that I, of my Gaussian surface and the outer, sh the, the entire cylinder that contains the entire charge. And it's a volumetric ratio. And why is it a volumetric ratio? It's because the charge is a den uniform density over the volume. So then the Q enclosed is just Q R squared over big R squared. So that's what you get here. Q R squared over big R squared. And then you have an epsilon naught. Then you can d cancel out one of the R's. And then you just get the electric field is Q R over two pi L R squared epsilon naught. So we can use Q R little R L and epsilon naught and constants. So that's fine. Okay. The magnitude of the electric field at R equals big R is 12 newtons per coulomb. What's the value of the electric field at R equals two R? Well, if I do the same thing, but now I wrap the thing in a larger cylindrical shell, right? What changes in my formula here? is the Q, like like this is going to be, like this part, this side is the same, but the Q enclosed is just gonna be Q instead. So the electric field at the edge is going to be, uh, or at, you know, outside of the, when, when the R is like now, you know, surrounding the entire cylinder, it's going to be um, Q enclosed over epsilon naught. So the Q enclosed would just be C. So I, I just write it out again. You do this. This would be the electric field times two pi big R, no, little r L equals Q over epsilon naught. And so the electric field is Q over two pi R L epsilon naught. And so look at this, when I double the R, so I double this from big, from big R to, um, to two R, the electric field is gonna drop by one half. So the electric field drops by uh, by one half, so it's equal to six newtons per coulomb, half of the 12. 
Derive an expression for the absolute value of the potential difference between the surface of the non-conducting cylinder and the inner surface. So if I want the electric field between the inner, th those edges there, like from here to here, I want to integrate from this point to this point, the electric field from R out to 3R. So I'm going to integrate the electric field over the distance from big R to 3R. And the electric field in that space is given by um, uh, this guy right here, Q over 2 pi R L epsilon naught dr. OK, so I can pull out the Q over 2 pi L epsilon naught. And you would integrate from there to there. But the integral of 1 over R dr is going to be natural log of R from big R to 3R. And so that's Q over 2 pi L epsilon naught ln of 3R minus ln of R. And then you can do the ratio. That's just going to be ln of 3. That's because ln of 3r minus ln of r is ln 3r over r. So that just becomes ln of 3. They said derive an expression for the absolute value of the potential difference, not a value. So they did, But they also didn't tell me that I can use a value. So I'm not sure if I was supposed to use c, but I'm going to leave this expression because they do say an expression. They don't say an a value. Um, so I don't know. I'm just going to leave it like that. On the following includes regions one, two, three, sketch the graph of the electric field. So in region one, the electric field um, increases linearly. Okay, so it's going to go up straight like this. And then in the region outside of that, it decreases. What did I find? The electric field was, what did I do for this guy? The electric field was um, this one right here. It goes by one over R, so then it will decrease. It's not going to go all the way to zero. Um, maybe I'll make it steeper just so I can sketch this out. So I'll make it like a straight line, then decrease it. Then the electric field is going to they're going to pump up and then go like like um, it'll jump up and then it will decrease one over R again. OK, maybe make it larger, decrease one over R again. Like that, something like that. Now, the electric potential is the integral of E dot dr. Or you can think of the derivative of the voltage is supposed to be the electric field. So like this, is, these are supposed to tell you the slope. So initially, it's going to be 0 sloped, because the slope of this should be you know, the electric field 0. But then it kind of goes positive. So it kind of goes like that. Oops, maybe not make it go up so much. We'll just make it go up. Then it sort of starts, the slope starts to decrease. So then it's going to like kind of level out, be concave down, if you will. And then it, it 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 pipes up and then goes again. So it <laughs> maybe I'll try to make it less gradual. So I'll make it like whoop, whoop, and then it's gonna shoot up a lot. So it's going to just um, shoot up, but then like level off again like that. Yeah, as the slope begins to decrease, like this, this is the value, the y value here is the slope. So you kind of these slopes will get closer to zero. That's like over here where the y value is getting closer to zero. So something like that. Non-ideal capacitor. Second one has a capacitor resistance, uh, internal resistance of capacitor to construct the volume equipment. They want the internal resistance of the capacitor. So single ideal battery potential difference delta V zero single ammeter single do 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 uncharged using draw a schematic of a circuit that can charge the capacitor and may also be used to study the current through the capacitor as it discharges through the resistor. So this is very similar to the one we did in set one, um, but we have a um, we might have a switch that shunts it to ground because I need to be able to charge this thing, and so I might you know have it like this, and. I'm going to put an ammeter here as long as it's in series. And then we'll just have it like switch from here to here. Oh, this goes to ground like that. So it's going to be able to switch to ground, basically. Um, this is R. And this is C. This is delta V0. The capacitor is fully charged by the battery at time T0. The capacitor starts discharging through the resistor. Show that the current I in the capacitor is a function time is given by this. 
Okay, so when we analyze capacitors, we always look at, um, oh, um, so this, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they have a non-ideal capacitor. I didn't catch that there. There's a non-ideal capacitor there. Call that RC. Okay, so you're always analyzing the voltage. Um, the voltage is going to be, the voltage across the capacitor is always A plus B E to the minus T over RC. Right, so that's the voltage. You always analyze the voltage whenever you're solving these kinds of things. You do the voltage and then you'll figure out what the current is. Okay, but you know the voltage initially is delta V0 because it's fully charged. And you know if you wait at infinitely long, the voltage should drop to zero because you discharge it all the way to ground. Right, so that the voltage should drop to zero. So then you say VC, so then you just kind of plug in. You say delta V0 is A plus B E to the zero, which is just A plus B. And then zero is equal to a plus b e to the negative infinity. As this approaches negative infinity, that thing goes to zero. So that's a. So a is zero. Therefore, b is equal to delta v zero. And so then you know your voltage that's across the capacitor is delta v zero e to the minus t. Now, what's r in the RC is the resistance you're using to discharge. So that's r plus RC. Oops. RC times t, like that. And then to find the current through the capacitor, well, I is just equal to um, um, C dV dt. So you just take the derivative of this. So the I is just equal to C. Derivative of this is delta V0. It's going to be e to the this, but you're going to have negative 1 over R plus RC from chain rule. e to the minus T over R plus RC. And if you just say that this whole thing is the initial current, you call this I0 if you want, then I is equal to I0 e to the minus T over R plus RC. Okay. Oh, uh, I keep forgetting the C here. It's RC, sorry. Uh, it's annoying because I say RC, but the C, there's a capacitance. Like, like the RC time constant is supposed to be R plus RC like the two resistors times the capacitance there. So I'm just fix that mistake there. Okay, students uh, determine the time constant tau for the circuit as a function of the resistance due to data shown above here. So this is the time constant. Let's do a line. I don't know, we'll do something like that and we'll adjust it. So let's pick this. I gotta tell it to fix maybe this side. This tool is not super great. I don't know, we'll just pick that. We'll just kind of do this. So we'll pick this point and this point. Or oh, we, did, we did the line of best fit, all right? Someone can complain to me if the, my line isn't great. That's fine. OK, what is this x value? Let's see, this is. 2.2, 2.4, 2, no, this is a quarter. So this is gonna be like, oh, all right. So these are each a quarter, oops. Let me pick a different point. Let's just pick, um, I don't wanna do halfway of a quarter. So we'll just do this and then we'll do, I don't know, we'll do that point right there, I guess. So this is 0.75, this is 2.0, this is what? Each of these is uh, a quarter. So this is like 0.2125. And then this is going to be 0.4. Wait, no, 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 no. Each of these is 0.05. Let me just mark it out. This is 0.2. This is 0.3. So this is 0.25. So this one is 0.225. And then this is 0.4.5. This is 0.25. Four five. This would be 0.475. Okay, so the difference of the slope is going to give you the difference in the y. 0.475 minus 0.225 divided by two minus 0.75. And then that's the slope. Zero point two. Now, what's the slope of Tau versus R for the, so your uh, your time constant, tau is equal to R plus RC times C. 
So this is not really a line. Um, as a function, as a function of resistance R. Oh, I see. So this is R C plus little R C C. So then the slope is the capacitance here, internal resistance. Oh, <laughs> I don't need the slope. Why am I doing the slope for? Oh my gosh. Okay. So what are we plotting here? This is my y value. This is my x value. This is my slope. I don't care about my, well, the slope I need partly, but then I need the y-intercept. This is my y-intercept right here. Okay, we don't usually use that too much, but I need to figure out the y-intercept. The y-intercept I'm gonna estimate is about, oh, we'll just put it right on that dot. We'll make that 0.1. So we know RC times C is 0 0.1, and we know C is equal to 0 0.2. So RC times 0.2, why do I know this is because the slope is C, right? This is equal to C, the slope is 0.2. So then um, I know it's 0 0.1, so then I know RC is um, um, 0 0.5. Okay. The ammeter is found to be non-ideal. Is the actual value of the internal resistance RC for the capacitor greater than, less than, or equal to the experimental internal resistance of the capacitor calculated in part C? Briefly justify your answer using the features of the graph in part C. So what would happen if it were not ideal? A non-ideal ammeter is gonna have some voltage drop. Ideal ammeter, no voltage drop. It just observes the current, no voltage drop. Well, let's say there's a little bit of a voltage drop here. If there were a little bit of a voltage drop, that means you did not initially charge the, volt, the, the capacitor to the full charge, right? So that means it's going to lower, oh no, in terms of the time constant, that's all that really matters. Um, that means there's some resistance here, basically, right? Because there's some voltage drop. Like uh, ideally, it's a member of the ammeter, we expect a very, very, very low resistance. That's why there's no voltage drop across it. But some resistance here. So there's some voltage drop. If there's some voltage drop. Then what that means is um, there's a resistance. And so my total resistance should be a little bit smaller. My RC should be a little bit. Oh, no, no. no. If I just. So then what that would do for my graph is it would change the y-intercept part because you would intersect, you would add in another resistance here, right? So it would, it would shift the y-intercept up a little bit, or at least like we would account, we would, we would think that some of the internal resistance was due to the ammeter. So is the actual value, it's less than because our calculation or our, our graph in calculation assume the y-intercept is only due is only due to RC but really it would account for R plus C plus R ammeter times C and so um, that means our RC is smaller than is, is actually smaller. Because we're including some of the ammeter as part of my our y intercept there. The values of the variable resistor on the original experiment range from 0.5 to 2.5 ohm. The experiment is repeated with values ranging from there to there. Would the slope of the best fit line be more steep, less mm -hmm. steep, or remain unchanged compared to do, 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 with the slope of the experiment's repeated values changing? with the slope of the best fit line. Um, the slope is RC, so so C is the slope in our graph, right? So it would remain unchanged, right? The slope is independent of um, R, okay? All right, number three, last one. Single loop of wire with resistance is three ohms and radius 0.1 meters placed inside a solenoid with a normal loop parallel to the axis of solenoid. Solenoid is 500 turns, 0.25 meters long, is connected to a power supply, is not shown. At time t equals zero, power supply is turned on, and the current is in solenoid is a function. It's given by this equation where beta is five. The direction of the current of the solenoid is clockwise as shown in the end view. So if I'm looking this way at it, this is what I see. At time t equals zero, is induced current in the loop as seen from the end shown clockwise, counterclockwise, or zero? Wait, the induced, let me see. Oh, the loop, the induced of the loop wire. So, okay, time t equals zero. Okay, so 
the current is going through here. What's the direction of the magnetic field? Is if you, my, my right hand is going in the thumb, the magnetic field from this perspective is going into the page, right? And so the magnetic field is going this way. That's the direction of the magnetic field right now, based on this direction of the current, okay? But the magnetic field is increasing. The current is increasing as a function of time. So we're getting more and more Xs. We're going like it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So what is the loop doing to compensate is it's creating a magnetic field going the opposite direction. The induced magnetic field is going to compensate it and put a magnetic field there. And so if you want a magnetic field coming out of the loop, then it would be counterclockwise the opposite direction of it, okay? So your answer to your justification here is we're gonna say, all right, so the, um, the um, magnetic field through the loop is going into the page from the end view. The um, current is increasing, which increases the flux, flux into the page. The induced current, induced magnetic field, current, current generates a magnetic field coming out of the page. out of the page out of the page to fight the to fight the change in flux which results in a counterclockwise current okay Calculate the current loop of the wire at t equals two seconds. Okay, so we want to look at the magnetic field, the magnetic flux first, and then from the magnetic flux, we take the derivative to find the um, induced voltage, and from the induced voltage, we can find the um, uh, the induced current. So the flux is b is the integral of b dot dA. However, this is like a small loop, and the, 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 mag the solenoid's magnetic field is primarily constant through here. So this is just the magnetic field times the area of the circle. So that would be the magnetic field. And what is the magnetic field in the solenoid? Um, I had to look up, the, look up what the um, magnetic field through a solenoid is. They give you that formula. It's mu naught ni. Okay. So um, this is mu naught ni times a. That's the flux. So the voltage is the derivative of the flux. Mu naught is not changing, n is not changing, a the area of the circle is not changing, but then this is di dt. So this is mu naught n. N is the is the turns per per unit length. So it's um, it's the number of turns divided by the length times the area pi times 0.1 squared, pi r squared, and the derivative i is just beta, beta which is five. And that's because i is equal to five t. So the derivative of i is five. Okay, so calculate the current. So it's four pi e minus seven times 500 divided by 0.25 times pi again times 0.1 squared times 5 and I get that is the voltage is 3.95 times 10 to the minus 4 volts but they want the current which is V over R so we're gonna take that voltage that induced voltage and divide it by the resistance of 3 ohms and I get 1.5 three one or three two times 10 to the negative four amps. Okay, calculate the total energy dissipated by the loop of the wire from times t equals zero to two seconds. Ooh. 
Okay, so let's get an expression for our current here. Our current is going to be, as a function of time, is the V over the R, and it's this. Oh wait, the voltage is constant because the rate of change is constant. It doesn't matter what the time is. Um, um, uh, the I is constant, right? The I is not a function of time because the di dt is always the same. That's cool. So the power is equal to I times V. And so the energy, which is just constant. So the energy is just the power times the time. So you just do I V T. So this would be 1.32 times 10 to the negative four times the voltage, which is 3.95 times 10 to the negative four times the time, which is two seconds. And I get 1.04 times 10 to the negative, what is that, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, negative 7 joules. The group of students attempting to verify experimentally the calculation of the current from part B. The current of the inner circuit loop at time t equals 2 seconds measured to be less than the current calculated in part B. Which of the following could explain this discrepancy? The current is smaller than we thought, right? So let's look at our equation. This is our equation for voltage. And our current is just this over R. So I'm going to just kind of rewrite that. Our current is equal to the mu naught N A D I D T over R, right? That's kind of what we, we derived here. So let's just see which one of these are. Did not account for the Earth's magnetic field. Not a factor. Plane of the loop is not perpendicular axis of the solenoid. Mm, that could change the area a little bit. That would decrease the area. And we want the current is measured to be less than. So it's possible it's this one. Let's go through all of them. Center of the loop is not in the axis of the solenoid. That wouldn't affect it because the solenoid is generally pretty pretty, pretty good. Um, uniform um, mag uh, magnetic field. Resistance loop is less than the given value. If I decrease the resistance, the I would be bigger. Let's see. What is it? The current in the inner loop is measured to be less than the calc what we calculated. So if we made this smaller, this should be bigger, not less than. The radius loop is actually larger than 0.1 meters. If I increase the radius, no, no, the radius is not, this is not radius, uh, it's resistance. Uh, radius would affect this. If it's actually larger, it would increase it. That would cause an increase in I. So it's this guy here. Why is the plane of the loop uh, different in the axis? That would reduce, so re it's a reducing A it reduces, sorry, this reduces the area perpendicular to the magnetic field. Which reduces the flux and thus the change in flux and change of flux. Okay, which reduces the voltage and thus reduces current. Okay, that's what I would put. The power supply is now turned off. The original loop of wire is replaced with a second loop made from a wire of the same thickness, made from the same material as the original loop of wire. The second loop has a radius of 0.2 meters, placed in the same orientation as the original loop, and fits completely inside the solenoid. So it's bigger. It's turned on, and the current in the solenoid is a function of given again given by the same equation, which is the following expression indicates the ratio of I2 over I1. Okay, so let's look at our equation. We just look at our equation here. Our I is equal to mu naught N I A, oh, sorry, mu naught N A D I D T over the resistance. Um, same thickness, made the same material. So the R is the same. All of this is the same. This is the part that's different. The A is pi R squared. Okay, so what we did is we doubled R, right? We doubled R from 0.1 to 0.2. So that quadrupled the area, quadrupled the current. So it should be greater than 2. So it should be the ratio should be 4x. Because I is proportional to the area, which is pi r squared. So doubling the radius results in 4x the area, and thus 4x the current. 
and I2 is the new one. Yeah. Okay, cool. I think that covers it.